I basically first off want to talk about the obesity of the epidemiology of the problem. As bioengineers, when you go out into the real world, this is probably going to be one of the biggest health challenges you will face if you decide to pursue anything in the health sphere. A lot of opportunity here, lots of problems here. All right. I also want to talk about the medical definition of obesity. It's actually a really interesting topic that's currently under debate at this point. And we'll talk about a bit about molecular control, the difference between the homeostatic and the hedonistic systems of control for appetite and, uh, and food consumption, and we'll talk about the current treatment, what's out there for, uh, for treating obesity. Okay? There are currently probably uh, as many, if not more, overweight and obese people in the world than there are malnourished people in the world. We've actually passed that tipping point sometime in the, in the 2000s. All right? Very interesting thought about that. Over 1 billion people in the world are over, overweight. The figure for malnourished is probably under that, probably about 800, 900, 000, 900 million. Over 300 million obese. And the United States is, again, one of the fattest countries in the world. According to that video, we're number one. We're actually number two nowadays. Saudi Arabia is number one. But not sh actually, I think it was Mexico. I'm sorry. Mexico, my apologies. Mexico is number one. But we shouldn't, it's not like we're congratulating ourselves or patting each other, ourselves on the back for that. All right? Um, in the United States, again, a third of the population is overweight, a third of the population is obese, and a third of the population is normal, all right, generally speaking. Now, you guys live in a Stanford, Stanford, it's a college environment, a lot of young people. You tend to probably not see that reflected in the college population. But in, in, in the population of general population in the United States, this is actually very true. And this is actually a very disturbing fact. A third of children worldwide are overweight. Okay? That's not good, because if, you, if you're overweight and you're a child, your odds of being overweight or obese as an adult really multiply. All right, so we're, that's something you want to think about. So like, this is a, not only a serious problem now, this poses to be a serious problem going forward into the future. Yes, Savani? Uh, ah, yes, so it's actually, I'll talk about that when I define obesity. It's actually, actually a medical definition. And we'll talk about it in a second. All right? Obesity itself is a problem because it lends, it basically is the root cause for a lot of these other things. All right? Arthritis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, strokes, hypertension, all of that is related to obesity. And what the heck is going on? Hmm? Yes. Yes. So, Sometimes it's a cause, sometimes it's a correlation. And, and it depends on the really, it really depends on the person. Right? Also increases your chances of getting cancer as well. Right? And if you're obese, you, you, you are more likely to die than obviously if you're not. Right? So what's the cause of this kind of growing uh, population of people who are going to be obese or overweight in the future? And you know, why are people, are, uh, generally speaking, obese and overweight right now? Well, a lot of it is that we're getting wealthier, all right? Um, this is an example of the kind of Chinese insurance. Uh, I use China as an example here because it's actually a very extreme outlier of this. But it's about the income, income distribution of China in the last 30, 40 years, right? You can see, actually, the poorest uh, quarter of Chinese people today are as rich as the richest quarter of Chinese people in the 70s, all right? Extreme outlier, but very much true. Um, the developing world is getting richer. That's actually a good thing. It, it bodes well for global health. It means that like basic diseases that affect poor populations are being reduced. All right. So that's a good thing. But what's happening is that if, you know if you're, if you're curing malaria, if you're um, solving malnutrition, these other problems of the Western world kind of come into focus. So things like cancer and, and obesity become bigger problems because you're you're, you're curing or solving these more basic. Uh, problems of that are more associated historically with with uh, uh, lower income. Yes. So cancer cancer is a is a problem of basically you're solving all these other all the other problems and then you'll because cancer is going to affect you eventually. Obesity actually um, increases that risk because you have more cells in your body. More cells means more chances of mutation over time. And that's what, why uh, obesity increases cancer risk. Okay. 
So again, okay, more wealth, what does that mean? Well, more wealth is generally correlated with more meat consumption. Okay, so this is a kind of a, uh, a chart of per capita meat consumption on the y-axis and income on the x-axis of all the countries in the world. You can see that it generally follows this curve. The richer you are in the country, the more meat you consume, yes? Meat in general, meat in general. Now, again, there's outliers, right? Japan's historically a very low meat consuming society. Uh, Brazil is very traditionally very high. We are also outliers on the list, generally speaking, right? But this generally true: the wealthier you are, you are uh, as a as a society, the more meat you're going to want to consume. All right? And also, this also lead, uh, leads into other food consumption uh, changes over time. So here is a list of uh, various things that people consume and changes over time of that consumption in from 1963 to 2003. Right? You can see percentages of change of consumption of meat. We have developing countries here, industrial countries, and China. China is a great outlier of that because it's actually a developing country that's really rapidly developed. So you can see over four decades, developing countries and China and increase a lot in meat consumption. They increase a lot in sugar consumption. They decrease in vegetable, green, green vegetable consumption, and decrease in roots and tuber con consumption. They increase in vegetable oil consumption and increase in grain consumption. So we're talking about a shift in diet, less fruits and vegetables, more meat, fats, and sugars. All right, that's going to directly uh, correlate to increases in obesity over time. Yes? We are more inclined for survival purposes to have foods that have um, high nutritional content and like dense nutritional content. So meat is a really great source of that. You have to eat a lot more in fruits and vegetables to get the same kind of nutritional content that you would for a smaller amount of meat. Right? So think about the time that you as a human being will spend eating. To put it in comparison, something, some, uh, an animal like a panda, they eat bamboo. They spend over 60% of their time eating food in order to get their nutritional content. So we, as omnivores who eat meat, will spend less time um, eating food. And that's actually like a, to our evolutionary benefit. Yes, Maddie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, yeah, this is also a societal thing where um, as the economy of a, of a society uh, grows, the um, availability of food becomes greater, so the prices of food tend to drop. So you think about how much, um, the average American, for example, spends on food today versus the amount they spent in like the 50s and 60s. As far as proportion of income, we spend less on food today than we do than we did in the 50s and 60s because the society has gotten wealthier and the food availability has gotten greater. So the prices have basically either stabilized or dropped for most foods. Okay? Especially processed foods. Especially processed foods. Especially like processed foods. Well. I'm not here to debate no, the no, ethics of that, no, no, no. okay? It's, it's interesting. Yes, all right. so, but, but generally speaking, the world in general is getting heavier. So this is a, a graph of various countries. You can see that over the last 30 years or so, this op rates of obesity and rates of, um, of, uh, of being overweight have increased for both ma male and female populations. Okay. So I want to go backtrack and sit, but and really ask, how do you really define obesity? What's the medical term? What's the medical definition? All right. So the current medical definition is based on body mass index. This is what doctors currently use. If you go to the office for a physical, right, they take your weight, they take your height, convert that to kilograms and meters, and do this equation. Kilograms divided by meters squared. And the number they put, get out basically tells you what category you're in. Okay. So I'm not sure how many of you have ever gotten a physical from a doctor and actually had your BMIs calculated. Anyway, hmm? all right, so you kind of generally know, right? So the medical definition is anything under 18.5 is considered underweight. If you're overweight, you're in this category, 20 to, 20 to 30, generally speaking. Anything over 30 is considered obese. And anything, and there's categories of obeseness. So you can be severely obese, and then there's more morbidly obese. Anything, anybody who has a BMI of over 40 is considered morbidly obese. That, that, that's really strongly correlated with a lot of health problems. Now, 
there's a, this is what doctors have been using for the, since basically I think the 50s and 60s for a long time to calculate overall like how you medically define obesity. Yes, John. I don't know, that's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, James, do you know? <laughs> 